Welcome to episode three of The Everyday Entrepreneur. Uh, I'm Michael Johnson, host of The Everyday Entrepreneur podcast, and uh, excited to have an awesome interview today with my friend Will Harris. So we're going to get to dive into uh, his ridiculous business, uh, which is <laughs> awesome, and um, all the cool stuff that he's you know been able to do and, and accomplishments and all that stuff. So hope you enjoy this episode. All right, ready to go? Let's do it. All right. So, first of all, we know each other probably from, we met at a wedding. I don't uh, know if you remember even. Whose wedding was it? Eric Swartz. It was at Swartz's yeah. wedding, okay. So, hey, Eric Swartz, if you're, if you're watching. <laughs> the um, big E. <laughs> so, we, which was probably 10 years ago. I think or, so, or 10 so. years ago, yeah. Um, which was awesome. You were, at the time, living in Ohio. Yep, living in Ohio. So, your wife was in the wedding. She uh, was. And uh, we happened to be sitting next to each other at the reception table. And yeah, I think we kinda, chatted music. Yeah we, ch yeah, we totally hit it off from a music standpoint. Absolutely. Um, which is probably easy for both of us to do because <laughs> yeah. uh, we love music. But So we hit it off there, kind of just um, got to know each other there. You were again living in Ohio yep. and then moved to Minnesota here probably. Uh, boy, maybe about six years ago. It would have been 2000. 2010, I think. Yeah. So eight, eight, years, eight years ago, ago now. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, and then kind of have been able to reconnect, uh, you know, f in the last probably few years, We've been able to work on a few projects yeah. together, which has been awesome. Um, and getting to know, and you, and you, your business has changed a lot over. Yeah. Oh, time. yeah. We'll probably hear about that. Sure. You know? <laughs> so, but yeah, so just, that's the cool thing is getting to know people, first of all, just from things we have in common, but how we've been able to. We both kind of being entrepreneurs mm -hmm. in different fields, but you know, similar ages, similar in just kind of growing businesses, I guess, right. in, that, in that aspect. So that's been really cool, you know, to to get to know you through that and all that stuff. So, um, but why don't you talk a little bit about your business? What do you do? Uh, yeah, what's your expertise and all that stuff? Sure. Um, so right now, I run an agency called Element. Um, and we're a marketing agency, so we do advertising, search engine optimization, social media marketing, influencer marketing, content marketing, a lot of different marketings, right? But the, the goal of what we're doing is to drive traffic and awareness to businesses. Um, a good chunk of our business today is around the e-commerce market. Uh, we're looking to start uh, branching out to a couple of other verticals now, but um, there's a, when you're growing a business, there's a lot of ways you can look at it. You can, you can drive awareness and traffic to an online store. Uh, you can increase your conversion rate. Uh, you can increase your retention rate, things like that. We focus on that first part, driving awareness and traffic. So that's where, you know, making sure that you show up higher in search engines, making sure that your advertising uh, dollars are spent the best online. So that way, you know, you're getting the lowest cost per acquisition and yeah. things like that. Yeah. So how did you get into that? <laughs> There's you a because you have your own company. Obviously, Element is your company. How yes. did you? How did yep. you know? Were you in advertising marketing before that? How did you? I was, and I'll try to. I don't know how long this yeah. podcast is, <laughs> and it's a bit interesting. So I'll try not to go too crazy. Um, going way back, I was a registered nurse. Yeah. I was at the U of M. I was trained in. And pretty that's much what you were doing when we first met. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and I was trained in pretty much every unit of the hospital. Uh, so I was kind of like a, a nurse hitman, right? I would call in and find out, say, hey, where do you need me tonight? We need you on such and such floor. And I'd go in, I'd work there. Um, and uh, during that time, I got frustrated with the way schedules were done in the hospital. Uh, a lot of it was still done on paper and pencil. And I thought, okay, I can definitely do a better job than pe paper and yeah. pencil. Like part of the reason why they needed me and why they were willing to pay more per hour for a per diem nurse was because of the, the changes and craziness of this schedule. Yeah. So I, I met with this guy, Chad Halverson, um, and actually Garrett Kramer is the one who introduced me to Chad Halverson. Um, and he was the CEO, is the CEO of a company called When I Work. Uh, and they were doing employee schedules, do hourly work, employee schedules for hourly workers. Um, There's a startup? Yeah they're, yeah, they're a VC backed, venture capital backed startup downtown Minneapolis. Yeah. Um, and at the time, I, talk to him because I wanted to use his API 
to build out the rest of what I wanted for the medical community. Um, and after a couple of meetings with him, we got to chatting about marketing and I had a whole bunch of ideas for him and, and uh, it worked out to where he said, I want you to come on board with us. Um, and they were just about to get their series A. Uh, and so I was employee 11 at this company. I reported directly to the CEO there, Chad. Um, and we were able to grow uh, within seven months. And I wrote an article about this on Medium. Maybe we'll drop the link in there. Mm -hmm. Uh, we grew 270% in the first seven months that I came on board. Mm. So, so uh, absolutely, you know, phenomenal growth. Yeah. Um, and a lot of that had to do with advertising. You know, with a series uh, A, you have finances that you can do something with. So, you know, I, I can't say that I could do that for every single business. Yeah. But when I had cash, I was able to hire a content marketer. I was able to, uh, you know, hire... Well, we had a social media marketer already, so we were able to do things that I knew needed to happen, but we also had money to spend on advertising. So at the time, we were doing things on Facebook ads uh, that most people didn't even know were possible, uh, and to the point where Facebook wrote a case study about it. They were so exactly. impressed with what we were doing, they said, listen, we, gotta, we wanna document what you're doing, and, and that's uh, you know, something we wanna talk and tell other people about. So then it led from that, and then I ended up uh, moving over to the e-commerce world. And there was another um, e-commerce store uh, in, based in Stillwater, Minnesota, um, where we were able to, I was able to help them come in. We were able to grow from about 3,000 products to over 70,000 products in, in a relatively short amount of time. Mm. Well, in doing all of this growth, I started writing about what we were doing, right? Just naturally, just, hey, I wanna give back the knowledge that I've learned and I was writing on uh, just some other normal websites and then that led to opportunities to write in Entrepreneur Magazine, in Fast Company Magazine, um, Social Media Today, other bigger websites, Search Engine Journal, uh, to where that led to people saying, reaching out and asking, can you help me grow my right. business, right? Because it's exciting stuff. Yeah. Um, and at first I was saying, no, I can't, you know, I'm, I'm too busy. Uh, in fact, while I was at that e-commerce store, um, I wrote an article on Fast Company about how to work 100 hours a week and not die. I think they changed <laughs> the title uh, to be a little bit less um, uh, in your face there, but, yeah. but the, the concept is still there. Uh, and it was literally because I was working 100 hours a week. Yeah. Um, but so, so I was saying no at first because I was too busy, but then I thought, wait a minute, I know so many of like these insane marketers, advertisers, and uh, you know search engine people that could just really help grow businesses. They're looking for work. I have these other people that are looking for growth. Why don't I, I've already vetted them? Why don't I start putting this together? And so that's really how Element was born. Um, it was born out of uh, a desire to help people. I, I love helping people and I hated saying no, but now I had the opportunity and I could help two different groups of people come together and get what they wanted out of this. Um, over the years then that's evolved, but it's, it's still the same concept. The, the goal is when somebody comes to us, we don't take everybody that comes to us. I wanna figure out, can I actually help you grow? I wanna help, but if I don't think that I can help, then I don't, I don't wanna be, you know, yeah. I don't want to be a cash burden for you either. Right. Yeah. So when you when you went from nursing to working with that company, then how did you were you doing some marketing as an as a nurse? Like how did you know marketing? Yeah. So Just, I did you have schooling background in that? Or I did. Um, and this is going back a little bit further than yeah. So 2008 2009 happens, and yeah. at the time I'm a nurse, uh, and I had only been a nurse for about five years or so. I, I graduated in 2005, so four years, yeah. right? Um, three or four years. I, I was the least experienced, uh, or the least seniority, I should say. Sure. Um, and uh, it, when I went into nursing, everybody said, oh, you'll never have to worry about a job. Well, then this major recession happened, and I had to worry about a job. Yeah. I was getting you know, part-time hours. I was more or less laid off uh, for a while. Um, it, it didn't count as being laid off because at the time I was a per diem nurse. So yeah. you don't have, even though I was working 40 hours, it, it didn't count as, you know, losing time. But so I looked at this and I said, okay, well, I, I'm still going to fight to get, you know, other jobs in nursing, but I should also diversify my education. Yeah. So while I was doing that, I went to school to uh, get a marketing degree. So I went to school and I got a degree in marketing management. Um, and, uh, I didn't. I wasn't using that in a career uh, during nursing, but at the time I was running a website called SixFigureNurse.com, 
Uh, I don't even think it even exists anymore. I think I maybe even have let that expire. But yeah. where I was doing a bunch of interviews with nurses doing really cool things in entrepreneurship, you know, there, there may be, uh, there was um, uh, real estate nurses that are doing real estate or nurses that are doing uh, legal counsel. And a lot yeah. of really interesting ways that nurses could take their education and be entrepreneurs and, and you know, make six figures or whatever that might look like. Um, and so that was kind of a, a cool way to do it. So I was doing marketing through that. So I was marketing my website. I was learning yeah. how to grow that, the search engine optimization and things like that. So it wasn't like I had zero yeah. background in it. Yeah, um, that makes sense. But I wasn't doing it professionally as right. a career. Right, okay. That's cool. So uh, let's talk then about entrepreneurship then for a second. So okay. being an entrepreneur, I mean, what was it that did you – because kind of from your progression, from what you do, it's almost like a progression. Mm -hmm. Some of it's kind of naturally happened, but at the same time, nothing naturally happens kind of when you're an entrepreneur. Sure. Like you have to make it happen. So like how did you, what was it about entrepreneurship that like, or, or having your own business or getting into that that really drew you to it? Yeah, one of the, the biggest reasons was working 100 hours a week, writing about working 100 hours a week and saying, I'm working hard, right? Um, and, and I was willing to work that hard. I, I probably wouldn't if it was just some other random job, but the, the, the people that I worked for at the time, they're my friends and they still are my friends, right? Yeah. So you work a little bit harder to make sure that you're helping your friends out with yeah. whatever they need at that time. Um, but I realized that if I would have put, if I put a hundred hours a week into building my own thing, yes, I get a, ideally a paycheck and I can pay the bills, but I'm also building equity into something then that I own. Yeah. Um, and so that was really where the light bulb started shifting that it's like, I don't have an issue with work ethic. I know how to grow businesses. I've done it consistently now. So how can I start growing other people's businesses, but also start building equity in my business yeah. as well? And I think that, you know, going from your story, something that I think is a true sign of kind of an entrepreneur is even going back to when you were nursing of the landscape changed. So you were looking to see what adjustments you could make or needed to make. Right. I think that that's kind of a, it's definitely a trait of an entrepreneur of, okay, how, what, whatever I've got now, what can I do with it? What else can I do? And, and, um, you know, have you always been like that even like growing up or was that kind of maybe the first time you really started like, so I've always been innovative. I've always liked figuring out ways of doing things that other people aren't thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, I would tell people when I was growing up that I wanted to be an inventor when I grew up. There isn't a career path for being an inventor, uh, but there's a kind of a career path for being an entrepreneur, right? And, and sitting down and saying, well, you know, I've got a notebook still of a bunch of gadgets and things that I would love to invent. Um, do you remember, I think, what was his name? Um, boy. I can't remember his name, but the, the guy from uh, Honey, I Blew Up the Kids. Okay. Right? Yeah. And I forget his name, of it, but it was uh, something like Ray Zielinski, and I might be quoting the wrong movie now. <laughs> but, um, but I wanted to be him, right? Like, I wanted to have, like, these, like, little Rube Goldberg machines that were, like, delivering my breakfast in my house. Like, <laughs> yeah. I love that. I'm a, a true nerd at heart. Yeah. Uh, I memorized Pi out to 59 digits on my way to work one time <laughs> simply because it fascinated me, and I wanted to, and because I could. So... Being a nerd at heart, thinking differently, causes you to get a little frustrated in a regular work environment. Um, not that people are doing it wrong, but you're convinced you can do it better. Yeah. And when you're aggressively and always focused on, I can do this better, I can do this better, it gets very frustrating being in a position where you're not in charge. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's a couple of ways to get to the point where you're in charge, where you can, you know, continue to move up the ladder. And that's definitely one approach. Um, but I think a uh, combination of my uh, self-diagnosed and, and I'm told as a kid, ADHD, uh, and that need to just constantly be thinking outside the box and moving forward and pressing forward, uh, that, that's what pushed me into, I, I got to do this. It, it almost became a, I have to do this for my sanity yeah. sake. Interesting. That, that's cool. So with entrepreneurship saying on that then how would you define entrepreneurship mm. that's a good question um, i think there's a lot of different definitions out there like in sure. people's minds of what an entrepreneur is and and it's something i've even kind of been wrestling with in my own head especially doing this show of, of like how you know how do you define an entrepreneur you know some people look at someone who's 
self-employed, not necessarily as an entrepreneur, they're just self-employed or solopreneur is a term yeah. that's kind of being thrown around right now. Yeah. Uh, some people, like I, I just, I wrestle with it because like I even see people that are, don't own their own business, but still are very entrepreneurial sure. in their position at the company they work for. Yep. So I'm kind of, I'm, yeah, I just kind of want to get your take on how you, you would define an entrepreneur. I don't know if I have a definition yet. I'd need to think about it a little bit more, yeah. but I would question, uh, I, and I have questioned to myself, and part of this is because I'm harder on myself than probably anybody else is, I don't know that I would consider myself to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, I, I throw myself in that category because it's just this generalized category that exists, but yeah. my job is still helping other people grow their businesses. Yeah. Now that is my business, but I, I still, I hesitate to really, truly, if I'm going to be very pedantic about it, I, yeah. I, I hesitate to qualify myself as a entrepreneur. Um, but well, because some people would say, if you're an entrepreneur, that means you invented something, sure, or like you created something, uh, you know, like a product or you know, service or whatever. Which you have a service that you've created. Yeah. Well, not that you yeah. invented it. Well, I think that's where you, I get a little bit hung up on it. You know, there are 800 billion, not yeah. really, but yeah. marketing agencies. Right. There's nothing, you know, that I could say that is overwhelmingly unique about it. I'd like to think that we just do it better than everybody else. We, we had a client uh, recently come to us and say uh, that 9 out of 10 marketers, you know, are completely full of BS. Um, and, and then he came to us and, and, you know, we completely changed things for him. And, and I would agree with him. <laughs> 9 out of 10. And that might be like a, a really nice way of putting it. Maybe a lot more than that. Um, so I'd like to think that we just, uh, the biggest differentiator at this time right now is just that we do it better and we're, you know, more aggressive than what a lot of other agencies would be, but that's, that's, that's a horrible differentiator. And I, I'll be the first to admit that, that as a marketer, yeah. I'm, I'm slightly disappointed with my own ability to really lock into what our differentiator would be. Um, so I, 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 I don't know that I really would call myself an entrepreneur. Yeah. That being said, um, we have other side businesses that my wife and I have started. A, you know, she's a photographer. Well, that's what I was, I was going to bring up is that we, the other thing we both have in common is that we both have to try to keep up with our wives <laughs> and, and how yeah. entrepreneurial they are. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> both of our wives are, which are both named Ashley. Yeah. Different yeah. spellings. Yeah. But uh, I have their own businesses, which I got to yep. get her on the show too, for sure. And sure. Interview her and uh, have her talk about you, which would be which would be fun, but... And I can't take credit for her business at all, and I, and I yeah. don't want that to sound like that. No, no, no. But no. I, I help with her website, right? I help with SEO for her website uh, and things like that. Um, definitely, we have conversations about it, right? About like, well, how should we handle this situation or what's the best way to set this up? And I mean, but it's, it's definitely all about her and her photographer. She's just she's fantastic at what she does. Yeah. Um, but then we've also got this other thing we're starting, which would be called Oak Street Barn. Um, and the website is there, it's oakstreetbarn.com, but it's not, uh, we haven't launched the e-commerce portion of it yet. Um, right now it's just talking about this mobile boutique. And again, I can't take credit for the creativity there. She is extremely creative um, and forward thinking and, and only limited by uh, just actual resources, time and money to be able to make some of these things happen. Yeah. Um, but so, but, the, but that e-commerce store is gonna get launched here pretty soon as well. Um, so, you know, we've got that and that and that. So now you start saying, okay, you've got multiple different side hustles. You're starting to get to the point where you would be considered an entrepreneur, trying to think outside the box and deliver something that's not necessarily being done or being, do it better than what other people are doing it. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if I could lock into an actual definition. Yeah, no, that's fine. That, that's cool. I, like I said, I just kind of wanted to talk about it, discuss it because yeah. it's something that I think that I'm even kind of in my mind, trying to define. Sure. And I think that there could be a lot of different definitions. I mean, when you look up the definition of it, it's really like someone that takes on greater than normal risk mm. to, to start a business or whatever. Sure. Which greater than normal is like $1. Like right. normally is no risk. Right. You know, uh, something like that. But um, so that's interesting. So going back to your business then, when actually I wanted to say in entrepreneurship. So one thing that's different about your, your wife, Ashley, is her, her dad was an entrepreneur. He had his own business. Right. So, and same thing with my wife. Her, her parents are very entrepreneurial, and, and um, which is great. Did you have that growing up? or No. Um, probably the opposite. Uh, my mom was very 
like you need to find something very normal. So I wanted to be a rock star. Yeah. That's actually what we I really still wanted want to, to be do, a right? Rock star. I wanted to be an inventor and I wanted to be a rock star. Like those were my like two career paths that I had in my mind, even up through my senior year of high yeah. school. Yeah. Um, and and I think my mom still today. <laughs> Absolutely. Still today. Sure. Sure. Abs well, yes, you're right about that too. So, but I think my mom was thinking that I would eventually just grow out of that, and yeah. I didn't. And uh, so then, midway through my senior year, she was like. We need to talk about this. You're like, you, you know, what about nursing? You're, you're compassionate, you love people, and I think that's something that you could do. You could work three days a week and then you still have time to pursue, you know, whatever else you wanted to, whether that's inventing or, or uh, your music. I was in a band at the time. And um, so I, that's, that's really kind of what led to that uh, in the first place. Um, so definitely, I, I would say that I, because it was a safe, career path, right? So my mom liked the idea of like, what was, what's the absolute safest career path you could take? Uh, my dad's an electrical engineer. Um, he played in a few bands uh, as well. And I would say like semi-professional where I, I want to say maybe sometimes there were 5,000 people in their yeah, attendance, well, right? So, yeah. so not small bands, but um, same thing there, like very steady uh, jobs throughout. Uh, I think that um, he maybe has a little bit more of the entrepreneurial spirit in him than what he allowed himself to have to make sure that, you know, he was responsible. And I think that's probably the same is true for my mom too. So they're divorced, they were separated. So they, they had to be responsible, right? Like my mom had to make sure that she just took care of what was necessary and she did a great job at that. Mm -hmm. So I think that out of necessity, they didn't, I don't know what their personalities would have been like. Uh, you know, 30 years ago when they, if they would have had that opportunity to go that route. Yeah. Um, but I didn't have that as an influence. Yeah. And I would say I was almost encouraged not to. Sure. That's interesting. Um, so getting back to your business, I got some sh sun shining. <laughs> um, getting back to your business. So in starting getting into marketing, we talked about, you know, you're going to school and all that stuff. But what were some of the other things that helped you kind of get into that? Um, and learn a lot in because one of the things that when we've every anytime we've ever met together and worked on projects together like your knowledge of what's out there and new tools and new tricks and new all this stuff like blows my mind because it's like not only do you have work you have to do but how do you keep up with all the I mean changing marketing is just changing so rapidly sure. right now especially in the online space um, but what are some of the things that you've done or did when you started to really, you know, grow, get your business started, but then also keep up to date on everything that's going on? I think a lot of that comes down to passion, yeah. passion for learning, passion for winning. I don't like losing. Right. Um, and, and just passionate about what I'm doing. I really enjoy this. I really enjoy finding ways to think outside the box, um, and do something that somebody else hasn't done. And the only way I'm going to do that is to know what's been done, right? So you, you got to research. And so I enjoy reading articles. I enjoy reading books, finding out what are people doing, what's working, what's not working. Okay, well, how can I apply that that's in the B2B space? How can I apply that to the B2C space or flip that? How can I take what's going really well in the B2C space, move that into B2B or what's working in e-commerce, move that to the lawyer space or whatever yeah. that might be. How can I take these things um, and, and blend them? I've got three little girls, yeah, um, and they're all very creative and fun. So I'm a little bit weird with them, and, and Ashley was probably moaning hearing me even talk about this. Um, but uh, even as kids, um, you know, they're they're learning to color, and so I'd have them color with their right hand. Okay, now great, now take that and color with your left hand. Okay, great, now pick that up with your toes and color with your toes, right? And just how can you do this with other ways? It doesn't always have to be with your right or your left hand or your toes or whatever. It's like, how can you do something different? And, and, and I would practice writing forwards. I'd practice writing backwards. I'd practice writing with both hands. So there was a time, so here's where I'm you know, going off the tangents. There was a time um, where I had practiced and I was good at it. I could write English with my right hand, Arabic with my left hand and speak German all at the same time. There's zero reason why you will ever need to use that in the real world other than I wanted to uh, use my brain to practice doing something uh, challenging, just to challenge it. Um, I just went on so many tangents that I don't even remember where the question started though. <laughs> Yeah, like, well, how did you, you know, get into it? But how did you stay? How did you stay fresh? Oh, in yeah. your so, so I think it's just out industry. of this desire to to 
do that to be like I want to challenge myself and I get bored easily if it's okay we've done that now for the last you know five months that tactic is old it's tired it's tried out by the time usually I'm writing about it it's only it's not that old but it's old enough to where I'm already over it and I'm yeah. already wanting to move on to something new so how do you know you said just by like reading a lot of what's kind of around the corner uh, Reading a lot and talking to marketers. So yeah. there's a couple of groups that I'm in on Slack and Facebook groups that, you know, they're talking about what's working that they're doing. And so we share ideas and I think you need to be able to bounce ideas off of other smart people, right? Yeah. If you think that you're the smartest person in the room, then usually they say you need to be in another room. And yeah. so I like being in these groups where there's just genius people doing genius things that I hadn't even thought of and that I can take what they did figure out what worked, what didn't work, and how I can take what they did and apply that to something completely unrelated. Yeah, okay. So when you, so if you were talking to somebody that was wanting to start a business like yours, like what would be some of the advice or, or some of the paths that you would say to, to follow to do that? Um, somebody actually just recently did ask me this uh, via email. So I have okay. a, a fairly decent answer that I can give, which was I, I don't know, <laughs> which isn't a great answer, but I don't know because I've only done it one time for myself. Yeah. So I can't say that this is the best way to do it. I can only say this is the way that I did it, um, but I, I like a few parts about the way I did it. First, I had a job actually doing this, right? So that first job was absolutely critical, and it was the first job where I was able to do it and do it well and prove that I could do it well. Yeah. And then use that to do it in another job where I could prove that I could do it well. So now with two consecutive experiences, and within them I had uh, a lot of room for testing things out, right? So the, there's a term called growth hacking. Um, yeah. And it's, it's thankfully evolved to be a lot more than what it was when it first started. Initially growth hacking conveyed this idea of like doing one really itty bitty tiny little thing that would you know, scale your growth by 100,000% or something ridiculous. Um, and the majority of those don't work. But the growth mindset is a good one, which says that, you know, if you test something out and it doesn't work, it's not a, it's not a failure. You just successfully proved that it didn't work. Part of that means you have to be able to figure out whether or not you are successfully testing something. Because if you do a poor job at it, you didn't actually test it to prove it didn't work. Yeah. You just proved that you were incapable of doing it. So there's a difference, but having this ability to say, we're going to test it and we're going to figure out how many times we can fail because we know that if we fail three times, four times, five times, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, whatever those are, those are going to be successes, right? Just a matter of numbers game now. So are you testing? Are you creatively thinking about other ways to do things? And as you do that, then you'll find different ways to be successful in that. So both of those roles gave me the ability to test a bunch of things out. So doing these jobs then allowed me, I think, that opportunity and a platform to write about what was working. And by writing about what was working on entrepreneur and, and big platforms, I had the ability to attract some eyeballs from other people who wanted help. It ended up almost kind of falling in my lap. Now that's just the initial part of it. Yeah. Uh, nothing has is been easy, right? Like I love those pictures where they say, you know, you're, you're at the beach and you're working from your computer. And it's really cool, right? It's like, oh, I wish I could work from my computer at the beach until you realize that you're at the beach working. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like it's not like it's easy. Um, I, you know, I, I travel to California maybe four times a year or so. Um, a couple of my clients are out there. And, uh, you know, I'll be basically at the beach and, and Ashley's like, you know, are you just having a great time at the beach or, or whatever? And I'm like, babe, I'm here. I'm in my clothes. I'm at the beach. I got a couple things done and, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm going to head off. I just came here basically to smell that, you know, salty ocean air yeah. and I got to get back to an office kind of thing. And yeah. um, so, but it's, it's a hustle. It's, yeah, you, I mean, you're it probably beats hard. being in a cubicle, but at the same right. time, you're, you're still responsible for doing all the work. Right. And it's the fact that you're taking your computer with you everywhere you go. You don't turn it off. Yeah. There's no like, hey, I'm done for the day. Uh, you know, you try to set times and I try to say that about five o'clock, I like to try to be done, wrap it up, go home, have dinner with the family, help kids with homework, you know, kiss my wife. Uh, and then, you know, maybe let's say eight o'clock or so they're in bed. I like to get back on and usually my wife yeah. being an entrepreneur, you know, we're, we're sitting there on our, our, you know, MacBook pros cranking away on the couch, just, you know, working away on our businesses. Yeah. Um, 
That's cool. I mean, I think that <clears throat> that's, I think a lot of people see, especially these, these people are posting like crazy about sure. being at the beach and all this stuff and know oh, I get to do all this as an entrepreneur and all this stuff. But, but you know, the truth is that can be, that can be legitimate, but there's still a lot of work. Right. You know, I would say, and if you're do, getting into it to be at the beach, probably not the, no, you know, the right path. No. In fact, I would say that there's two different types of stress. <laughs> Having talked to a lot of different people uh, doing different types of entrepreneurial work, um, you're either going to be stressed out by having somebody tell you the way they think it should be done and it's their business and you got to do it kind of thing. Or you're going to be stressed out by the, wow, I have so much work to do and not enough time or now I don't have enough work to do and not enough money and then, oh, I've got so much work. And so it's this constant up and down battle, right? And it's, it's an emotional stress that weighs on you that way. Um, and I was told that it doesn't get easier. Uh, I was talking to somebody and, and I don't want to say his name because I can't remember 100% who it was. Um, but he, if I remember who it was, it's somebody that owns a very, very, very big multi-billion dollar business. Yeah. Uh, whoever it was, it was somebody that was in that position. Um, and he said that it doesn't get easier at that level, right? Like as an entrepreneur, you think, you know, once I hit this much income, then I'll feel good. You don't. He said, when you get to his level, then it's, you know, you still have those same ups and downs where it's, you know, daily or hourly. You're just like, you know, oh my goodness, this is, you know, we're all going to lose everything. And it's like, oh, this is the best thing in the world. It's just at his level, when he has a bad day, it's like, oh, we lost, you know, $20 million today. Yeah. And it's, that's a lot to stomach, no matter who you are. Even if 20 million is very small in comparison to your business, you're still like, crap, that sucks. It's $20 million, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, so it's, you have to figure out which stress are you more uh, willing to work around and deal with. Yeah. Some people, I remember someone saying that, someone referring to someone who had, had had a lot of success in business and all that stuff. And, and he said, you know, everybody's got problems. Sure. It's just, you know, who, what problems are you going to have? Is it going to be paying the bills or is it going to be trying to figure out what kind of paint you're going to put into your new house or whatever? Like, right. And the, the obviously the, the point of is, is that, you know, we all, the grass is always green on the other side. And yes, if you are trying to, figure out the paint in your house, then maybe you should be still stressed out about it and realize sure. that it's not that big of a deal because you have a very blessed life. But at the right. same time, no matter these days, especially like no matter where anybody is, stress or anxiety or, or depression or whatever can be a very you know real reality for that person. It's really yeah. about loving what you do yep. and being happy with what you do. In finding a community of people who can support you. Yeah. Um, I don't think anybody, you know, we all like to think that we're the lone wolf, you know, and we're out it. We can do it on our own. And, you know, even when every, when even in the face of adversity and everybody's against you, that you can, you know, push through and, and do it no matter what. And the reality is, I would venture to say that the majority of people who were able to push through, maybe the experts were pushing back against them. They had somebody in their corner, whether it was a spouse or a brother or a friend or, you know, parent or somebody that was willing to say like, hey, you got this. Because there are going to be times where you're just like, you, you feel like I should just, I should quit. Like there's, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm failing or whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I would say that every entrepreneur goes through very extreme cases of that. Yeah. Um, I remember reading a book, uh, it's called Love Work by Dave Mortensen. Um, he's the oh, really? global owner of Anytime Fitness, yeah. uh, co-owner. Co um, and they talk about how, and, and I don't remember the exact year that this took place, but there was a moment in time where it, they had the opportunity, and I, I might be misquoting it, but they had an opportunity to sell. Um, and, and logically, that was probably the right decision, mm -hmm. right? Like logically, that made more sense. And I think one of the partners at the time did and they had to buy out that but th so they decided it was like the worst economy this may have been 2008 2009 yeah. horrible economy um and they decided that they were going to like leverage themselves and buy out this other partner because they wanted to keep it in there and they could grow it and it worked for them i, I want to say you know within the last few years they were entrepreneurs number one franchise in the world yeah. several years in a row so it was a gamble, it was a risk, and it definitely probably wasn't easy. And I'm sure there were a lot of people saying, don't, you guys are making the wrong decision here. Yeah. But they had people that supported them and said, hey, you know, we're in your corner and we'll, we'll make this happen with you. Let's go. Yeah. And That's I think we cool. need that. 
Yeah, for sure. And that's, man, that, that'd be a tough decision. Sure. Right? Yeah. <laughs> to make. Absolutely. So I want to see if we have any questions um, by anybody that may be watching live on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, let me see here. If you got any questions, pop them up. Man, a lot of people on today. That's good. Good comments. Good support for sure. Cool. No questions today. If you do uh, ever want to ask questions live, you know, in these interviews, you can follow my Facebook or Instagram, which I'll talk about my website here in a second, but where you can, you know, follow that because every time we shoot these, we shoot them also live on Facebook and Instagram. So you can ask questions um, to the people that we're interviewing and get some advice or get some feedback or, you know, any of that kind of stuff. So um, with that, maybe just want to talk real quick about who is someone that should call you to work, you know, for you to do some work for them. Who is somebody like, that should call yeah, me? Yeah, what type of business? What type of business do they have? Size? <clears throat> so are, are you familiar do? with the book, Good to Great? Yeah. I've been really appreciating that mentality. Uh, and, and I'm redoing our agency, our positioning, right? I talked about how I don't have that locked in yet. I'm getting closer to that. Um, the new version of the website is going to be going live hopefully within the next couple of weeks. And we're focused entirely on advertising. So we're gonna be getting rid of a lot of the other services that we're doing. Uh, because we've found that the thing that we do, that people are the most excited about whenever we work with clients, it's what we're doing on the advertising side of things. So who should call me? It's anybody that wants to grow their business, mostly going to be um, online businesses, e-commerce, SaaS, something like that, uh, that, it has a budget to spend on advertising. And I would say, you know, our, our minimum budget we're probably gonna look at is about 25,000 a month. So they've, they've got a budget they're, they're willing to spend and they're, they're wanting to spend um, on advertising. And they, they, they know that if they spend some money on advertising, they've already proved that it's working a little bit mm -hmm. and they're ready to double down, but they don't know where to go and how to get the returns that they want. Yeah, okay, cool. And we'll put, I'll put, uh, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube or on my website or whatever, we'll have, all of you know Will's website and and definitely follow him too on like his Twitter and all this stuff too because you know he I know he's like he says he reads a lot of stuff so he's constantly retweeting and uh, you know putting out stuff that he's writing you know yep. an entrepreneur and all this stuff but other uh, really really interesting articles um, in your space and all that stuff too so thanks man. appreciate you being on and uh, thanks for having me yeah for sure so if you got um, like I said follow get more information on my website michaelwj.com michaelwj.com um, you can subscribe to the podcast there on iTunes Google all that stuff also subscribe on the to the YouTube uh, channel if you're watching you know via video video so again thanks for being on today man appreciate it good all to right. see you we'll see you next time